We know that the Switch is a huge seller and may well surpass the Nintendo DS and PlayStation 2 to become the biggest selling console of all time. But there is one metric in which it's actually the GameCube that is the most successful of all Nintendo systems. More successful than the Wii, better than the DS, although the Switch could still give it a real run for its money if it starts catching up soon. So let's explore this metric and see why it's actually a really important one for the health of Nintendo systems going forward. The one metric we're talking about is the ratio between games purchased for a console and consoles purchased. If we look at the numbers up to the end of 2023, the GameCube has 9.59 games purchased for every console sold, putting it ahead of the Wii at 9.07 games for every console sold and the Switch at 8.61. Further down the list we have the Famicom at 8.07, the Super NES at 7.72, the Wii U at 7.64 and the N64 at 6.83. Then the bottom tier is made up of the handheld consoles, the Nintendo DS at 6.16, 3DS at 5.16, Game Boy Advance at 4.63 and finally the Game Boy at 4.22. So why is this such an important metric and why are these results seemingly so asynchronous with other measures of success such as sales where the Nintendo Switch is far in the lead? First of all let's be clear it is possible to have a system that sells a lot of hardware units without this necessarily translating into high sales of games. In the case of the Game Boy, many people bought variants, especially in the later years where a multitude of different editions were available. Whether these purchases were tapping into the nostalgia market or just for people who stuck with only a small number of games, like the people who bought a second Gold Soul to play two-player Pokemon at home, it's clearly the case that handheld consoles fare far worse in the relationship between games and consoles, with the table showing a clear hardware software split. It's a pretty simple equation if you think that people are more likely to buy secondary handheld consoles then there is going to be a lower game console ratio even if people buy the same number of games. There's not even a link to longevity as the long-lived Nintendo DS has a ratio of 6.16 games compared to the even longer-lived Game Boy's 4.22. Home consoles have been known to have variants but less often, and people were far less likely to collect them in the same way. Nintendo has looked to track this information before. In 2008's End of Financial Year Investor Briefing, Satoru Iwata led by demonstrating the gap between the number of hardware units per household and the number of players per household. As he put it, we gather data on how many DS systems are owned per household and how many users per household are using DS and we have mapped the comparisons between the five countries like this. As you can see, a huge gap exists between these two figures. If we can narrow the gap, we can create new and large demand. Of course, we will never stop our endeavour to encourage the households who have yet to have a DS to appreciate DS and purchase one. Simultaneously, we'd like to make efforts to make the steady transition from one DS per household to one DS per person. In other words, we'd like to approach and appeal to each one of the family members of a household which already owns one DS. This is our next challenge. Almost the exact same language would be used just over a decade later by Shantaro Furukawa in terms of increasing the market penetration of the Nintendo Switch. So in general it seems to me there are two reasons for the numbers to be as they are. The first is the price of the games. N64 titles retail for something that adjusted for inflation would seem inconceivable today, as much as 70 US dollars or even 70 UK pounds. Adjusted for inflation these games would cost about 130 US dollars today. Small wonder that fewer people made the commitment to buy them. GameCube games tended to retail for a more moderate $50, which is still over $80 adjusted for inflation, but was a significant price drop compared to other hardware. 
but it's not just the price of the games but the passion of the consumer that is important. People love their GameCube and while Nintendo's fan base may not have been as broad as at other times in its history, it was certainly passionate and engaged and bought a lot of games. But you might say the Wii comes second in the game to console ratio and yet this was notoriously a casual focus system with the core player base ending up so alienated that Skyward Sword became the worst selling 3D Zelda despite shipping on the largest install base of any mainline title. However, there are some reasons why the Wii may have had a bit of a head start. For one thing, the Wii was unusual in having a pack-in title from the start, at least in America. Reggie Fieser may have to argue his case strongly and won out, so for many people purchasing a console, they were one up on the games front right from the off. Even discounting this initial game though, Wii only falls just below the Switch and is on pretty much level pegging with the NES. The other factor of course is longevity. While the GameCube lasted for a short time but did burn bright as it did so, the Wii not only lasted six years but continued to sell and sell because people were slow to graduate to the Wii U. It's true that the last few years of the Wii were relatively low selling but of course this was made up for by the very very long tail and in fact Just Dance only discontinued its Wii editions in 2020, a year after doing the same for Wii U. So we can see why the N64 ratio is low, why the GameCube and Wii are high and why the handheld consoles are at the bottom of the list but what about the Switch? The Switch has a lot of the drawbacks of being a handheld. It does serve multiple generations and explicitly banks on people buying multiple versions of the system so different family members can play. In 2021, Nintendo estimated that 20% of new purchases over the previous years had been from households buying second Switch consoles, probably driven by the success of Animal Crossing New Horizons which required a console per island. This ratio must have only increased since with so many Switch OLED editions customers were upgrading from their previous editions and yet despite this it continues to sell massive numbers of games. It is not entirely clear from Nintendo statistics whether this includes shorter titles and indie games which would not have been present on the N64 and therefore may skew the findings in the Switch's favour. These cheaper titles are more likely to be whim purchases which would drive up the total number of game sales. Also though, and crucially, the Switch has managed to combine the reach of the Wii and some more with the intensity of the GameCube fanbase. It also has a staggering number of games to draw from. In the financial year ending March 2023 alone, 337 third party games and 13 first party games were released in Japan and this presumably does not count Nintendo Switch Online signups. By contrast, at its absolute height, the 3DS had, in Japan, 117 third-party titles and 12 first-party titles in the year ending March 2014, while in the same year in Japan, the Wii U had 30 titles, of which 11 were first-party titles. The fact that the Wii U was as successful as it was Topping the mighty DS on this chart with more games per Wii U than games per DS is a testament to the hardcore audience of Nintendo's stable of unique and brilliant franchises and perhaps foretold of the intensity with which people would cling to huge selling Switch games like Breath of the Wild and even Luigi's Mansion 3. All of which goes to show that the Nintendo Switch continues to show its strength even without yet topping the list. Though if game sales continue to outpace the console sales significantly it may top the list in years to come anyway. And does this really matter in the end compared to the headline numbers and of course the cash value in the end of those sales? I think this metric is something Nintendo will play very close attention to going forward. Selling consoles is one thing but managing to get a steady supply of game sales is also important and this is a strong indication not just of the current status of their console but also of the health of their entire enterprise. If people are buying lots of games, and in particular if people are buying games despite the fact that they have multiple consoles already, it implies a strong interest in Nintendo products. However, another key consideration for Nintendo is getting games onto shelves in the first place, and this video on screen explores why some titles appear to be going out of print 
and what the implications could be for Nintendo's game library going forward. Thank you for watching and I will see you next time for another Nintendo Forecast.